Previously on this channel, we discussed the importance of a supply chain specialist over someone with more classic data science capabilities. Here at LOCAD, this is known as the supply chain scientist. And today, we're lucky enough to be joined by one of our own, Maximilian Barth, who's going to tell us a little bit more about his daily role and responsibilities. So Max, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, perhaps as always, you could just start off by sort of telling us a little bit more about your background and also how you came to sort of join LOCAD. Yeah, sure. So as you can probably tell by my last name, I'm actually not French. So like actually a lot of my colleagues in the supply chain scientist community, I, um, I'm an expat working here in France. I'm German, and, but basically like everyone else, I, I've lived in a few different places. Uh, I lived in the US growing up. I lived in Finland for a while and in Australia, and now I'm here in France. And uh, just like basically everyone who's a supply chain scientist at LOCAD, I have a STEM background, so basically science, technology, engineering, math. Uh, what maybe sets me apart a little bit is that I have a finance background. I don't have a classical engineering training or anything like that. However, I actually think finance also works really well with working in supply chain, as the two actually are very similar. In finance, you generally optimize your portfolios for returns while minimizing the risk that you could face from markets and it's very similar in supply chain science we try and optimize our clients inventory for maximum return with minimal exposure to risk and demand variance. Okay yeah. brilliant and today uh, Johannes we're sort of talking about a day in the life of a supply chain scientist um, I know we spoke about it before but maybe it's worth kind of revisiting why is it that you kind of implemented that sort of supply chain scientist capability at LOCAD? So as usual, it was not like a stroke of genius where I, uh, it was more like we tried to, <laughs> to have like data scientists the traditional way. It went badly. I mean, and, and by the way, I include myself in the first round of, of I, would say, um, I would say, inadequate data scientists. Uh, I, I, LOCAD was founded as I was quitting my uh, PhD, which was done in computational biology, um, as were basically at the time, that was not exactly the terminology of the time, but it was basically distributed machine learning. So it was data science uh, in, 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 uh, in all its glory. And, and so, but it turned out that really paying attention to, um, uh, to the minute details of a supply chain really matter. And, and actually, um, just like uh, what Maximilian is pointing out, it depends on where does your commitment lie. And that's, that's a big question. And the question is that does it lie in using fancy tech or does it lie into getting actual practical results? And that's, that's really, that you might think that it's, oh, it's just a subtle nuance, but no, actually, the reality entails uh, things that are very different, dramatically different even. I mean, it's, it's do you care about really the, 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 the financial risk and performance? So you're going to spend really time discussing of what risk mean, what, uh, what it means in your system, how do I even understand that? Or do you spend time, um, you know, uh, polishing uh, a gradient booster tree so that you can have a slightly more provable convergence proof? or whatever, uh, that gives you a, a slightly better algorithm where you might actually get a publication at some point, you know. And uh, those two persons, they're working on the same problem, but one is having a data science perspective on the problem. The other one has a supply chain science perspective on the problem. Yes, it's in theory, it's the same problem, but in practice, it's not exactly the same results that you get at the end of the day. Okay, and today we're gonna kind of learn a little bit more about kind of what it is you do in your daily role. Um, so what do you see as kind of the, the core parts of your role? I think the role is actually very multifaceted. So there's multiple components to what you do every day. There's obviously the technical side. You're coding a lot. You're trying to understand your client's exact supply chain needs, the nuances of where their challenges lie, and trying to really understand what solution will suit them best and also what exactly their wants and needs are. But then that also kind of already transitions into the next real part of the role, which is kind of the relational aspect of it, being able to talk to clients, trying to figure out what are the right questions that you're trying to solve for them, where really do their challenges lie, what, is, what specifically their needs are, what makes them different from someone else. So trying to really build the right solution for them. And I think the third aspect is probably a bit of a project management perspective, 
we generally sit on projects where, especially if they're small, we're the main person driving it, at least from the low cat perspective. So we're trying to coordinate with our clients how to best move forward, how to prioritize, what tasks to tackle first, and yeah, basically that. <laughs> And understanding kind of the wants and the needs of uh, our clients is always something we find uh, fairly entertaining from time to time. Um, what do you see is kind of the, the most important part of the kind of the daily role of that supply chain scientist? I mean, literally, I think the first, the most important part is really depends on context when the supply chain is on fire because of a pandemic or something. I mean, first you need to put out the fire, you know, it's, it's, that's also where, again, that's a matter of commitment. If you're a data scientist, your commitment lies into having like a superior algorithm. I believe that uh, frequently the, what is the most urgent and pressing task is much more mundane. Uh, the ERP is crapping on you because of whatever, and the data is just uh, completely out of place. You have duplicate records, you end up with completely incorrect stock records. Uh, whatever it needs to be addressed it needs to be addressed like right now and and the problem is that you have like so many mini fires that some of them can potentially be postponed and the uh, in terms of resolution yes it would be nice if, if it was like 100 percent clean but uh, when you're operating over a sizable supply chain having like zero you know glitch in ever in anything in all the i would say the data set that you process in uh, in the processes themselves in the way people actually consume the results that you give them extra it's i mean it, it cannot be like a a, a, a zero um a, a zero defect you know you, you can't deliver a zero defect solution so uh, at some point you need to prioritize again euros or dollars worth of, of impact and that's so the I, I believe that in terms of pressure the supply chain scientist is always kind of reprioritizing you know what is really the the needs to be addressed now what is important what is you know strategic okay what's your kind of angle on that as sort of how do you balance your time between sort of implementing code communicating with clients and then how much of your time are you sort of spending sort of fighting fires i think that's actually a really good point generally the start of your day is always making sure that there's no fires you generally get to the office check on all of your accounts make sure nothing broke overnight i mean we obviously have clients all over the world in all different time zones so while we sleep they actually work so your number one priority generally is making sure that everything runs as it is supposed to and that our clients have the dashboards ready to use that was actually my morning today fixing basically an erp change that wasn't communicated to us not the most glamorous of tasks, but definitely the most important thing that happened that day, because after fixing it, all of the data could be updated. So just for that, I think in general, you're splitting your time, is, it depends day to day and week to week. It's obviously a, a tight rope you have to walk. You don't want to spend too much time in, in meetings, talking to your clients, because then you don't actually have time to implement anything. But you also don't want to only work because you may be doing something that's actually not in your client's best interest or what they actually had in mind. So you really have to closely communicate and strike that balance right. And I think overall, maybe the balance between actual implementation work and communication of clients, whether it's for emails or calls, probably lies on average somewhere between 20 to 80, 20% 20 communicating and 80% then actually executing what was communicated and discussed. Yeah, that conflict's kind of really interesting, isn't it? Because you sort of, you have to spend some of your time communicating, having meetings, but obviously you're sort of spending some of your time kind of feeling like you have to be doing the more technical side of things. Um, it's a very kind of multifaceted role. Um, was that always kind of the role you envisioned or did you ever consider taking a more kind of classical approach where somebody would be, one person would be responsible for the, the client facing side of things and one person would be fully focused on the technical side of things? Again, we tried, we <laughs> tried the classical way. The classical way is you have somebody talking to the client then in turn, this person uh, writes specification, pass it to IT, and the IT try to you know implement the communication, and then you end up with this um, with this situation where the message goes from one person to another. You know, it jumps a few hops, and there is <laughs> a, a very high percentages of information that get lost in every hop, and so at the end you end up with a poor software engineer that implements something that has nothing to do with the problem with five days of latency you know just because it had to go through us that so so the problem was what it was kind of broken by design i mean uh, 
during the very early years, I, I could manage, you know, with, with a bit of help of a few colleagues to me play, you know, have one hat where I was the sales guy selling, you know, an idea to the client, then starting a very, I would say, dirty implementation, passing the dirty implementation to the software engineer and say, this thing is working, but uh, in terms of software quality, it's complete crap. So you need to kind of try to, to make it better and a bit more unit tested, a bit more, you know, lean in terms of performance and maybe a bit more organized, but they, they already had a prototype. But the point is of this approach is that it's incredibly ad hoc-ish in terms of technology and it's, uh, and, and plus, you need to have somebody who can have all the hats, you know, uh, from sales to, um, uh, to data scientists, to supply chain scientists, to uh, all of that, uh, um, pr product manager and everything. So, so I realized that this, this way of splitting the work was actually not, w it would never really work well at scale. And, and by the way, I was seeing on, on, uh, on our clients at the time that basically everybody was complaining about IT, but IT was complaining about everybody also. Because IT, the people in IT were saying, okay, they say that we do, uh, that our work is this small, but look at the specification and requirement they give us. It's this small as well. So you know what? We are on par with them. <laughs> so, but that, that's just the wrong way to look at it. And, and basically but what Maximilian do is that you, there is no middle manager, you know, where, I mean, you, you're literally, and I think that's something that is pretty unique. It's the client talk to you. I'm talking of a real, you know, supply chain practitioners that has literally, uh, you know, in the warehouse facing the stores and everything. And, uh, and then they talk to you and you go directly to actually implement the recipe. There is no like middleman with uh, uh, a software engineers that you talk to, you don't coordinate. Uh, but in order to do that, we had to engineer some dedicated tooling so that you don't waste too much time dealing with pure technicalities. Yeah, I see that as being probably one of the big challenges for a supply chain scientist. You have so many stakeholders and many people pulling on you for kind of your attention and you're actually spinning so many plates, it must be pretty difficult. Um, so what do you kind of see as kind of the key challenge of, of kind of your role? I actually think that's probably the key challenge is that you have to deal with so many stakeholders while also taking on so many different roles. So the upside to that is also though that you are the one point of contact and that when you're talking to someone, you're the person who has discussed the issue with them, but also the person who knows what was implemented and how it was done. <laughs> so there's not a lot of knowledge that gets lost in translation between the multiple steps. So I think that's the main advantage, but also obviously also the main challenge because you have to be able to do so many different things quite well. You want to be able to actually write a good solution for your clients, but also really understand what it is that they need. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, there's no running away from it, is there? If you're, you're in trouble and you've done something wrong, you're definitely held accountable. Um, for a supply chain scientist, we're very adamant they need to have some a good understanding and some good supply chain such supply chain expertise. Um, if you were a data scientist, how easy would it be to transition into the role of someone like a supply chain scientist like Max? Um, the paradox is, and I believe that that look at that the case, it's actually way harder for data scientists to transition to supply chain scientists than it is for. I would say generic engineers or, or, or people that have, I would say that are, that have like, uh, in, that are, I would say numerically minded in general uh, to transition toward this role. It, it's funny, there is two words in French that exist, but I don't think that there is an English translation. It's uh, the, uh, the difference between a mathematician and a matheux. You know, it's okay. like mathematically inclined or like literally being a mathematician. What we need is people that are, that are, I would say, that have a taste for numbers to a large extent, because yes, we, I mean, supply chains are large. You can't just have an intuition of thousands of products. So you need to have people that have a taste for, uh, I would say, quantitative matter in general. But, um, but the, the trick is that it's, it's a very applied role. I mean, uh, Maximilian is literally helping companies to, de to take decisions on millions of euros of uh, physical assets. It's, it's really, really tangible decisions that at the end of the day get made. Uh, so so you, you need to have the, this mindset that is, it's literally uh, a very concrete engineering problem that you're addressing. And, the, um, and I know that it might not be <laughs> please the, the data science audience, but, but my experience was at Locate that it's, it's actually 
very difficult to convert, especially people who have been doing data science for a few years, to actually be, become good at what we call a supply chain scientist. Because again, the focus is not the algorithm, the focus is um, the fact that you have a numerical recipe, another episode that we recently did, that the numerical recipe end-to-end -end really makes sense at a very high level. And it doesn't really matter whether it's sophisticated or not. If you can basically get away with a, a semi-trivial you know, solution, excellent, jobs, uh, jobs done, and uh, jobs done simply. Yes, you won't get a paper just because you've you figured out that a slight numerical coefficient adjusted just the right way does the magic. You can't publish on that, but if it does the job, you know, why not? And, uh, um, and so uh, our experience was that um, although we do have PhDs that do, that are, I mean, we have, we have people doing PhDs at LOCAD, actually. Uh, we have five in total. Uh, I mean, two have already completed their PhDs. Uh, three are still in progress, but I'm confident that they will, they will be able to defend their PhDs. But uh, literally for us, those people, they are on the uh, pure software engineering tracks where it's not even the same timeline. I mean, uh, people are tackling problem and thinking, you know, of delivering solution over the next three years. That's the timeline of a, uh, of a data scientist, you know, on the, the platform side. So they, they, they think about something like differentiable programming. We have, we have somebody doing a data scientist doing a PhD on differentiable programming. And this person is literally building and engineering the building blocks of differentiable programming, but this person is not solving any actual supply chain problem. Maximilian is doing that. And, and Maximilian, when you're working, I mean, I, I, I'm not too sure on which problem you are, but typically the time frame is uh, um, you're looking, you know, from one day ahead to maybe a couple of months ahead, but certainly not like three years ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just not even the same time scale. Okay, we kind of spoke a little bit there about kind of the challenges in your role, what are maybe quite difficult. And um, if we turn it on kind of its head, um, what about what's, what's kind of rewarding about your role? What is it that you really enjoy? I think the most rewarding thing is probably the diversity of problems you face and then how tangibly you can actually solve them. You really, a client comes to you with something that they've found no solution for yet or only a really bad manual workaround where they work a lot in Excel and then we can deliver something that automates that problem for them, really freeing up their time to work on something much more important. And th there's always a lot of value we can deliver for our clients, uh, oftentimes even outside of the, just the pure uh, decision making we can deliver, even just reporting. We generally, after cleaning all the data, will have oftentimes a much better picture of our client's business than maybe even they do sometimes and we can generally deliver a lot of value for them there, and that's always nice to see. Yeah, that's great. And I think uh, one of the things I've always kind of remarked about LOCAD, uh, if maybe our viewers kind of checks out on LinkedIn, you'll see we're very much a very kind of multicultural, international kind of team, uh, particularly with the supply chain scientists. They're coming from all over the world. Um, why did you create a team like that, and why was that something that was important to you? I mean, first, uh you see, it, was, it wasn't exactly an intent. So we, have, we are super diverse, but not because we choose to have super uh, diverse uh, hiring policies. So you see, it, it wasn't the consequence of we need German people. And so <laughs> we went for Maximilian. It was literally, I mean, it's literally first, we, we, my thinking went uh, this way. I don't want, um, as part of LOCAD, to have, um, I would say, accident in the design of the company that literally excludes certain classes of people. Uh, by the way, if you have, uh, we have about one third of women, we didn't have one today, but, uh, uh, but we have one third of, of, uh, of the company which is made of, of, of women, which is quite a lot for a tech company. I mean, those tech companies usually are at like 10%. So uh, how do you achieve that? Well, you start to make sure that the way, you know, the company is set up is not directly adverse to young women just because you have crazy hours. Um, uh, I would say um, some sort of, of behavior that are just hostile where women just see that and just run away and saying, I'm never going to be part of this brotherhood. Uh, so, so, so you see, it's, it's not about what you do, but mostly first what you don't do so that you don't immediately start by excluding people. So um, there are a lot of things that you can do to make sure that uh, you don't literally uh, scaring away um, young female engineers. And similarly, uh, if you, for example, we are in Paris, but if you immediately start by saying, well, you have to, p to speak perfect French, um, well, suddenly, you know, 
it kind of narrows down your option to French people or maybe you know the former French colonies like Algeria, Tunisia, etc. But but uh, literally you end up stuck with with uh, you're narrowing I would say accidentally your options. Then once you remove that, you 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 just have a lot of candidates that apply like Maximilian, and, and you just have to start sort out people by by skills. And guess what? It just so happened that French France, despite you know uh, all my belief doesn't have a monopoly on intelligence and diligence and etc. So it just turned out that uh, on average we are now a French nationals at Locad are only 40% of the employees. Uh, the, the rest are typically non-French national, mostly European Union, but not only. Uh, and, and again, I believe it's, it's, not, it's not a discrimination or that we try to actively seek for this diversity. It's just then when we try to do our best to basically rank from people who are literally, you know, uh, two criteria, smart, get things done. That's basically <laughs> literally, you know, the two core values. Uh, when we start judging people on that, where well, it just turned out that frequently uh, we end up with non-French people being hired. And I, I mean, I, I, I really love France, that's my country where I'm born, but, but as an employer, uh, I need to hire first and foremost, you know, the people who will serve the company best, not just uh, the one that just end up being born at the right place. Yeah, it's a good job you kind of didn't rule out perfect French because I think both me and Max would have been <laughs> in a world of trouble. <laughs> um, if we start kind of wrapping things up a little bit now, Max, um, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's kind of maybe considering a career in the supply chain industry or indeed as kind of a supply chain scientist? I think for my job, the most important skill that I find the most valuable, like what's helped me the most is to learn to ask the right questions and to see things from multiple perspectives. I mean, our projects generally have multiple stakeholders. And while you may have one contact person who you talk the most with, you always have to remember that they also represent other people. So you want to really make sure that you find a holistic solution that fits everyone well. So I think being able to see things on a very like holistic perspective and being able to raise the right questions is probably the most important skill that you want to develop. OK, great. And Johannes, to sort of conclude, what advice would you give to someone who's maybe an aspiring supply chain scientist? I would say get real, you know, and, and, and there are so many ways to, to, to be not real. Kago, I mean, Kago is, is fantastic games, but just, just that, you know, it's, it's, it's games. So um, algorithms, same things. I mean, it, it's, um, it's uh, uh, fantastically interesting. It's a fantastically interesting branch of mathematics, but it's not real. I mean, not, not directly, very indirectly. And so my, my suggestion is, if, if you want to start a career in supply chain, um, you need to get you know, your hands dirty, delve into an ERP, start looking at what the data really look like, not the I idealized version that you get in textbooks that is already you know, completely clean and perfect and well arranged, and, and indeed deal with having many, many shoulders. That's, that's really difficult because uh, how good is your solution if basically uh, the company end up uh, fighting uh, among itself, you know, just because um, you, don't, you haven't really find a way, uh, figured out a way so that the solution is acceptable from, you know, all those various yeah. parties. That's, that's ex that indeed, that's a very, very tough challenge, but, but you have to do that, that will be, you know, the concluding thought while preserving your engineering values that you want to have something that is akin to a capitalistic process. You know, the, you're, you're, you're not just a consultant that produces PowerPoints and deliver things. You are, I mean, Maximilian, you are, you are delivering something that is working in production and hopefully that can even run without you, you know, so that there is a real asset that is being engineered and improved over time. It's not, uh, it's not PowerPoints that are being delivered. Okay, brilliant. We'll have to wrap it up there, but thanks both for your time. Thank you. So that's everything for this week. Thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again in the next episode. Thanks for watching.